It all sounds good at the podium. Well, Hawkeye fans, I will say that uh, certainly there is substance to what Tim Lester brought uh, forth in his introduction to the fans and media today. And we will discuss here at Hawkeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you all stopping by as always each and every Tuesday, 530 Eastern, 430 where it counts. <clears throat> and uh, no, uh, Corey does not have a new set of glasses. Uh, Corey <laughs> will be joining us soon. We got Tom Cakert here from uh, Hawkeye Report on on three. Tom, we appreciate you stopping by, sir. Hey, it's great to be here and great to finally meet Iowa's new offensive coordinator and get to kind of pick his brain a little bit today. Well, before I pick your brain with a lot of buzz terms and words that he dropped, uh, we'll just get your initial impressions, Tom. Um, I was impressed with, with Tim and what he said. I, I think he said some things that are going to be receptive to Iowa fans who, you know, were a little less warm to him maybe uh, initially. I think he – he was um, open to change, open to um, making some alterations to the to the offense. Um, loves tight ends. I think that's music to Kirk Ferentz's ears and probably to a lot of Iowa fans' ears. Um, he's going to run some RPO. Uh, he's going to do some different things. It's not all going to be like the old Iowa offense. So I, I think from that perspective – it sounds okay. Now the proof will be in the pudding and what they, they put out there. You know, I asked him about the, your starting quarterback is probably not going to be available this spring. What challenges does that present? He talked about that and, uh, but he doesn't seem to think it's going to be um, a hurdle they can't overcome because Cade McNamara has plenty of experience. So um yeah, overall positive. Uh, Corey was there as well. He can he can speak to this as well. Yeah, Coach, I, I think you recognize this guy. Yeah, Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm was there as well. Corey I just walked in my door, so I got about a about four and a half hours of driving for me round trip today. But it was worth it. I wanted to to be there, and uh, I was really impressed with Tim. And, and I'll uh, I'll gladly pivot off of my initial reaction that I had on the Sunday when this news came down, I was very skeptical. And some of that's, I talked about it based upon comparing the power five backgrounds of both Johns and Lester, but I was really impressed with Tim today. And part of that is just his knowledge as a quarterback. I think Tom kind of brought that up. Just his knowledge of the passing game is going to be so valuable. And um, Kirk was asked about the RPO. And I think it's fair to say that that's going to be a part of the Iowa plan. I don't know how much how much that's going to be integrated, exactly what it's going to look like. I, one thing that stood out to me, Tom, I'm curious if you caught this as well. Um, I believe it was Tim that actually brought this up, but uh, what he felt like he gained from a year at Green Bay. And I think Kirk mentioned it as well, but that just seemed to be, I mean, obviously Kirk downplayed what happened at Syracuse a long time ago. But what we saw at Mich Western Michigan and then being able to, to be a part of the uh, Matt LaFleur um, staff there mm -hmm. at uh, Green Bay for a year, um, I, I assume that he learned a lot from that experience. And he brought up Elmhurst because that was a Shanahan system as well. So he's he does have a lot. Of, I mean, he, he coached his style of football, but there's some intricacies there, right, Tom? Yeah, and I, I think diving into this last year for him is, is really worthwhile because – um, I, I know some people were trying, some people who were, uh, let's just say skeptical of the hire were using it and saying, oh, well, he was a defensive analyst. No, he was, he was an an analyzing the offenses of their opponents and presenting it to the Green Bay defense. Um, and it was even more than that, uh, from what I've been told, uh, just studying some of those. And, and so he's studying you know, the San Francisco offense, Kyle Shanahan, what they run. Uh, studying Detroit with Ben Johnson, one of the better offensive mind, young offensive minds that that, um, that you'll find. Uh, every one of the teams that Green Bay played this year, he was basically diving into that world and studying that offense and, and presenting that to 
the defensive staff and to the defensive players for Green Bay. So you have to learn a lot in that time. And you're probably picking some things up. You're like, boy, this is really good. Um, and, and he kind of hinted at that, but it was emphasized to me um, uh, later today from some people that they're like, yeah, there's, this is a lot that was going on here. And this is going to be helpful because that's, that's, um, that's where you learn. You, you know, you don't know everything, but you can watch what other teams are doing and and you know there's <laughs> that's one of the great secrets of football and, and and really any sport i mean you know you've got basketball how many people borrow uh, brad stevens's inbound plays because he's so good at his inbounds plays it's the same thing in football you see something you're like boy i'm gonna run that and see if i can make it work and he's got a lot of different route concepts i thought that was interesting uh, when he talked about the different route concepts thought it was interesting that he's going to be upstairs and he right. talked he talked a lot about how important that is and how you get a better view of things and i think that's great i really do that's the most that's maybe the most important thing i took from today maybe that's me being short-sighted but the fact that he went out and said in-game adjustments are so important and they're so hard to make when you're calling plays or trying to to see things from the sidelines and that has been a criticism that I know Don Patterson has had and uh, about the situation with Brian ever since his press box meltdown in 2017, he ended up moving downstairs. And it is, I, I can't imagine, especially a guy who didn't have play calling experience, that did not help Brian. Now, that was his choice, I guess, to, to be down on the sidelines. But I, I think that's wonderful to hear that. I, I think fans should be encouraged that their play caller is going to be upstairs. Yeah, I do, too. I think that was that was. um you know, important an important thing to learn from him was what he how he's going to do that um, because I think you know there's value being downstairs and he talked about that when he was you know as a head coach he just had to be down there and call plays but you see so much upstairs you just do you've got a full view of the field you can see what they're doing from an adjustment standpoint uh, defensively. Um, and understand what's going on. And as long as you're able to communicate and you've got people down on the sidelines that can communicate what you want done to your players, you shouldn't have any problem. And, you know, he should have that very easily with, you know, the offensive line coach, running backs coach, tight ends, uh, and the yet to be named wide receiver coach. And Tom, you brought up wide receiver play. Um, he was asked about, you know, getting the, the ball into the, the hands of his playmakers. One thing I appreciate, and this is a quote from him, he said that we're going to be disciplined and aggressive. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that's probably like, well, that's obvious. Any play caller wants to be disciplined. Any play caller wants to be aggressive. But the aggression, I think, is really going to tickle the ears of Iowa fans. But he brought it up early. Like, uh, I think it was his... The, the was his opening there. statement. Yeah, it was. And he brought up the, the uh, struggles that was in 2021. I'm getting the years mixed up 2021 or 2020 with Western Michigan, where he took play calling back because they were just a mess and they were struggling protecting the football. They were struggling to move the ball down the field. That is the balance that if you're an Iowa fan, what you want, you don't want Kirk to abandon the uh, emphasis that he places on protecting the football and on turnover margin. And they haven't been the best in turnover margin. The defense has produced good numbers, although this last year didn't have nearly as many takeaways as we're accustomed to seeing with Phil's group. But that's got to still be, and that's been the formula for all this success. So um, I think that's here, the positive thing. Here's one of the other interesting things, what he looks for in quarterbacks. He values efficiency at quarterback over mobility. So mobility is kind of icing on the cake is what he kind of termed it. But he wants guys that are efficient. And I think when he's talking about efficient, he means don't turn it over, play smart, and and make good passes, make good throws. Yeah. You know, just manage a game, be efficient. And um, I think that's what he was getting at there. But, you know, he's not opposed to a mobile quarterback. He's just like he just doesn't want him to make a lot of mistakes. And that's probably a good thing. And uh, I know Kirk was asked about the I questions in the chat about wide receivers coach and Tom, uh, Don Patterson and I had a conversation with you about a week ago 
and you, uh, what you, the comment you made was that you have a feeling it's going to be Bud Meyer, but we've not gotten anything official. And, uh, I believe you asked the question of her yeah. and, um, he said, quote, we're on a good path. Yeah. As it relates to that hire. Do you still feel like John Bud Meyer's the guy? Or you... Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I framed it kind of in a different way where, you know, when he hired Greg Davis, who was an outsider to the Iowa program, um, he brought in one of his own guys, Bobby Kennedy is a wide receivers coach. And I was curious if that was something that maybe he would be open to. And it, Kirk kind of danced on that question. <laughs> he went in about four different directions on that question without saying a whole lot and basically saying, um, it seems like he's got somebody that's in the pipeline, so to speak. Is that's how that's how I read it. Um, just like I've, I've we've got things moving in, in a certain direction. And I know a couple of notes that I had written down here. Uh, real quick, Mark. Um, Kirk did uh, go into specifics as it relates to confirming numbers that I think a lot of people like Tom had had already known about as it relates to serious candidates for the job. He mentioned yeah. a 10 to 12 person list, conversations with six, extensive conversations with four. Um, I would assume that those four, Tom, were Paul Christ, Kevin Johns, Tim Lester, and Joe Philbin would be my guess. Um, I don't know if he had the extensive ones. You know who it might have been? It might have been Chip Kelly. Yeah. That's, you that's, know. I don't know how extensive. Kelly was. seems to be conversing with anyone who will listen to him about um, getting a, a getting out of UCLA. So, right. Um, yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. Here's one thing that really impresses me about Tim. He does not come across pompous, not from my perspective at all. Yeah. And I really really appreciated Don Patterson's perspective a week ago on the show when he talked about what Scott Schaefer had to say, because Scott Schaefer, I mean, I don't know that Scott's got any loyalty to talk up a big game about Tim Lester, but by all accounts, he is who he appears to be. And I don't, the one thing about, here's the silver lining for fans who are maybe a little bit hesitant or still skeptical. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being skeptical about the, the, the lack of power five experience. If you really read into that, I think the one silver lining there is, is it possible that there's maybe a, a degree of humility um, with a guy like Tim Lester, as opposed to getting a guy like Chip Kelly or a Cliff Kingsbury or a Kevin Johns, who's coached at a high power five level and maybe has a little bit of ego just naturally, right? Just human inclination. You know, maybe that ego is not there with Tim and maybe that's a good thing. I didn't sense any of uh, ego no. from Coach Lester today. I thought it was interesting that Kirk brought up like kind of, celebrity coaches guys who were yep. i think that was the response to you correct yeah um, it, was. It, was, it was about guys who are wor more worried about certain things and their image and all kinds of different things than than and being for the record, i thought it was a, i thought kirk answered that question wonderfully um and my question uh was simply you know we when i had a conversation i think we talked about this in the show last week as well um, I thought it was interesting, you know, Kirk has downplayed total offense for a long time, but in the university's press release about Tim Lester, they touted his total offensive numbers and rankings at Western Michigan. So my question was, you know, is that, are there goals as it relates to total offense criteria for evaluating moving forward? Does it remain the same? And I don't know if Kirk, I don't know his initial response to that question. I think maybe he felt like I was bringing up something in the past. I was not trying to do that. Obviously, Iowa's total offensive rankings have not been good. But as it relates to moving forward, how much of an emphasis does he place on that? And I appreciated the fact that he brought up what you just said, Tom, and talking about kind of these flashier coaches who are all about numbers, and I totally get that. But what I thought was good at the end is he brought up, if we can, and it was just refreshing to hear him say it, if we can run, or if we can have 500-plus total yards of offense a game and hold them to 150, great, let's do it. But it's not priority number one, and I respect that answer. I thought it was a it was a really good answer. Oh, uh, by the way, I, I don't know if you saw this. Um, um, this was on Buccaneers.com. Chad Leistico from the Register just tweeted it out. Iowa special teams coordinator Lavar Woods interviewing for the same spot with Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I, I did see that in the chat uh, a few minutes ago, and I wanted to ask you about that. So is this is that surprising? This is official. This is from Chad Leistico. 
you hadn't heard this prior. Well, this to is, it is up on the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers website. Oh, okay. All right. It's at Buccaneers.com. Um, and it makes you wonder if, well, is this a reaction potentially to Seth Wallace, who we spoke to today, being named the assistant head coach? You wonder. As in, like, yeah. questions about why LeVar wasn't given a heftier maybe, rate promotion? Maybe. You know, you wonder about that. Um, or is he trying to expand his horizons? Does he not want to be part of, um, I don't know. Is he is he one of the growing number of coaches who is tired of where college football is headed? <laughs> you know? Um, maybe. I think it's it's interesting timing coming just a couple hours after a press conference where a lot of us would have been able to ask that question to Kirk. It, it says on Tuesday, the Buccaneers announced they've conducted a virtual interview with LeVar Woods, who is currently the special teams coordinator at the University of Iowa. Earlier in the day, they also confirmed interviews with Saints assistant special teams coordinator Phil Galliano and former Seahawks special teams coach Larry Izzo. Okay. So, yeah, I'm seeing that as well here, right from the Buccaneers website. So they also have spoken to a couple of other guys. Maybe he is just kicking the tires a little bit, but uh, it is it is interesting. Yeah, I think I know I know that um, last I think it was last year, or the year before, he got approached by Nick Saban to be Alabama's special teams coordinator and turned that down. So just interesting. Uh, well, they don't want to lose him. I mean, I think from an Iowa standpoint, no, lose no. he's been uh, so it's important. Been great. Too. He's been great. Yeah. And uh, and you don't want to lose somebody at this point. You know, you're, then you're going to have to go out and find somebody to be your new special teams coach. Uh, when you're bringing in a new punter, um, you, you have a Drew, St Drew Stevens back as the place kicker. But Drew, I think we'd all agree, struggled late in the year. Um, you know, it would be be interesting where Kirk would go with because he would have he couldn't he couldn't wait a whole lot uh, real long um, to find a special teams coordinator. Maybe he would hire from within. Um, you know, promote an Abdul Hodge or somebody like that into that position, and then hire a tight ends coach. I don't know. Well. Um uh, there's not much behind Drew Stevens. <laughs> no, but, well, they got the they got the um, the kid coming in, freshman. Yep. yep. Um, uh, who has the same who had the same uh, same kicking coach yeah. that Drew had. Yep. So they got Trip Woody coming in, but yeah, it, it, that's uh, that will be uh, with the new new punter and just everything uh, an interesting storyline to follow here. I don't know how long these searches typically take. Um, you mentioned a, a number of candidates that were mentioned on the Buccaneers website, but that will be a storyline to follow. Um, have we talked? Have you talked about Seth Wallace yet, Tom? Uh, really haven't. Really haven't. I. I uh, so Seth talked uh, just well. I guess second to Kirk Mark uh, towards the beginning of the press conference, and uh, just kind of an intro to his new position. I, I don't get the feeling like there's a whole ton of, of job duty changes, right? Um, I think one thing, Tom, you said last week on our show was, you know, maybe in a situation where you're in a bond and you need someone to, to fill in as acting head coach. Now you have a natural candidate for that. But uh, same thing with Seth Wallace. I'd apply Tim Lester. Uh, like I really do detect a level of humility um, from him. And I know he went through some stuff back in 2020, along with all the off field yeah. accusations and, um, you know, I don't know, we, we only know one side of that, but I get the feeling that maybe he's, he's learned from his experiences. And as a result, he is not a guy who wants to rush into anything. He doesn't seem to be in a rush to jump to a defensive coordinator job or be a head coach. His focus, at least what he says, his focus is on the now. Um, now I'm sure he's thinking of, I mean, he's sure he's thought about head coaching opportunities down mm -hmm. the line, 
but he learned from his dad. He grew up in what Brooklyn, Iowa. Um, he's a small town Iowa kid. Grinnell, Grinnell, in, in Grinnell. Yeah. So, um, interesting story for a, an Iowa guy who has climbed the ladder. Yeah, he is. Um, you know, it's kind of a classic story. A guy who starts as a, you know, a GA, small college player, played at Co. Um, you know, then does his GA, then goes to Valdosta State moves up there, up the ranks, and eventually is their D.C., and then comes back to Iowa and is back down at the lower level of the totem pole. I remember when he came back, uh, Eric Johnson had left as a recruiting coordinator, and that was kind of Seth's role at that point in time was recruiting coordinator, and I talked to Seth quite a bit, um, you know, just just about what might be going on and got, you know, he was – it was always very helpful. Um, I even then I could tell this guy's different. You know, he's the arrows pointing up with this guy. So he did a terrific job, and he's worked his way up. And uh, now he he was the you know assistant DC the last couple of years. And you know sometimes you create titles to to bring in more revenue for a guy. And there's some of that because you want to retain talent. You've got to figure out a way to much like you're doing now with NIL with players and trying to retain talent that'll go out and play on Saturdays. You want to retain talent that is in your building every day, teaching those players. And Seth has had a number of opportunities. Had one with a big 10 school last year that I know of had one with another big 10 school this year that I know of. Um, so he's had, he's had these really interesting opportunities and um, he's turned them all down. And the big reason is the, the head football coach um, and, and there's an appreciation to him for the opportunities that he's been given. And that tells you a lot about what makes him tick, but he's also making a million dollars a year now, which is, you know, <laughs> that that makes things life, life a lot easier, right, Mark? I'm Mark, all for that. Know? Yes, I, I think that. <laughs> Mark, you know all about making the million a year. So yes, absolutely. So but yeah, so I can right relate. Here. One thing that he said, and I know you could say call it just toss it aside as lip service, but he made the comment multiple times that he wants to be here. Well, it is easy to, to want to be somewhere that's paying you a million dollars a year, but you do get the sense not just from him, but I've talked about it on, yes. on my show before his players really do have an admiration for him. They and I don't think that's, that is not a, uh, the, I won't even mention the person's name, but the person in the comment that is bringing up uh, how he bullied Jack Kallenberger, forced him off the team. He is a bad person. Just remember the person who's saying that in the chat, whose name will remain unnamed for now. I've seen some of the crap that you've put in the chat, bullying other people in the chat. So before you uh, call out other people, let's just check yourself for a second. And just because of, even if he was guilty as charged with what happened with the whole Jack Kallenberger situation, like I, I'm so done with the cancel culture in the world where you just, someone makes a mistake and you, they just never can have a life or never build a reputation back again. What a joke. So based on everything I've heard from Seth Wallace, I know you're closer to him than I am, Tom. Um, I have no reason to believe that if that did happen, he's learned from that. And he has every right to be able to continue his career. As and, and I'll, I'll say this too. I, I know the Kallenbergers. Okay. I know Mark and Jack and their family. And I know um, Seth. And nobody felt worse about it than Seth did. He apologized to him. Everything is good with them. Yeah. It's all good between him and the Kallenberger family. That's I great. Mean, I think Mark is working. He was for a while. I don't know if he still is, but he was working at a pizza place in, in um, Iowa City area. And Seth would go there and get pizzas and and there's no problems. Yeah. Everything is good. So, um, yeah, he, you know, he, who among us hasn't said something that's stupid? Well, Tom, you know, know, if if if, uh, think about if each one of us had the worst moments in our lives highlighted on the national scale, well, we, we'd all be done. We, yeah. we we'd be done. So I just get so tired of that that mindset. But anyways, I brought it up just simply because I love a a, a good 
comeback story, if you will. Not that he, I mean, he had a great reputation as a coach prior to that. He's a great recruiter. He's a great recruiter. But man, he he is. Uh, I've just heard nothing but rave reviews from any player since that time period, since 2020. Anybody that's come to that program has just raved about him. And we've seen the results on the field. People who have wanted to come back, like Jay Higgins, like Nick Jackson, um, go down the list. Jack Campbell. Um, and Kyler Fisher is another example. That's another thing that we didn't bring up, Tom. The fact that his room now has their top three linebackers back. Yeah. Any one of them could have moved on. And how about the uniqueness of this? And he didn't give himself credit for this. It was kind of just a, an intricacy of the recruiting cycle. The fact that this past this past class, 2024, they get three really talented linebackers from the state of Iowa. That's a unique thing that doesn't happen every year. With within 50 miles of Iowa City, all of them, as you've noted, with uh, um, one from Williamsburg, one from uh, um, Winfield Mount Union, and the other one from Monticello. I mean, uh, that's pretty good. And all of them are really good. Yes, They're they all are. really good, uh, all really talented. And, um, you know, he's already got a talented room and talked about now, how do you negotiate with some of those? guys that have been really patiently waiting and like a Carson Shire or a Jaden Harrell or somebody like that, that now they're going to still be behind. Um, it's going to be interesting. So what do um, you do? Do you, I mean, I don't want to throw out names, but I've asked this question before, like how many guys can they head into fall with at that position? Good question. I would just expect some attrition there. Um, they're at 92 total. Yeah. Um, so that's a spot. Maybe they could, could drop somebody, but we'll see. Uh, I, I think that gravity seems to take care of itself there. You know, you just, you, you eventually get there. Um, but you've got the limited portal window, so we won't know until April 15th. Although guys could say, I'm done. I'm going in the portal April 15th on March 15th, if they would like. So you can announce your intentions. You just can't go in until April 15th. And, and then, you know, I, one of the other things that I'm going to be really curious about is on April 15th or sometime around in April, um, does Iowa get engaged with the quarterback? Because I think they might. That's going to be one of the stories of the spring. Who's the backup? And is there going to be somebody to come in, be brought in that might fit better with Tim Lester and might, you know, fit better with what, what he does. And can they come in and potentially unseat Cade McNamara? Is there, or, or at least be a better backup option than Iowa had this year. I think that's, that's going to be one, that's going to be the story of, the spring is the development of Marco Lanez and if he's going to be the number two guy or is Iowa going to be looking for um, a number two who could potentially push Cade McNamara for the top spot. I am curious. Um, and I didn't get to ask that. This is a question that uh, during the, the Tim Lester availability, I was not able to ask this question, but I wanted to ask him about his viewpoint on playing multiple quarterbacks because that's something we haven't really seen Iowa do by choice. Uh, certainly not under Brian, but even under previous offensive coordinators, um, unless there were struggles. So I'm just curious what what his mindset is on playing multiple people with multiple skill sets. Say it's a Cade McNamara and a Marco Linez. Yeah, I don't know. We don't know how he is about – I know Kirk's not a big fan of it. Yeah, um, I know Kirk's not a big fan of it too. <laughs> of rotating quarterbacks in a game, he does not not warm to it. I think the last time that happened was the 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 Hawk Slayer Bowl. Yeah, it was really the last time that happened. So, so what are the what are the chances, Tom, that maybe Kirk looks in the mirror here and says, "Well, if Tim likes it, maybe I need to be open to it." I think that's more of a possibility. I do. Especially early on, I think he's going to be um, warm to it. I think he'll be warm to it. Hey, guys, I've got to run. I've got to get on a radio show here in about two minutes. You're a popular so. guy, Tom. <laughs> I know. Check, hey, your, your, appearance check, your, your appearance check is in the mail. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it.
Tom, Appreciate thank it. you so much. We appreciate okay. it. Appreciate you guys. Take care. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Tom Kakert, uh, Hawkeye Report, to uh, join him right there on three. Why are our tiles not changing? I don't know. What well, <laughs> we're going to have to do, do that. There we go. I guess we'll go with that. Interesting. I've never had that happen before. So Tom there at the end was playing my tune there about going to get uh, a transfer quarterback to challenge Cade McNamara. He's pretty, he's pretty bullish on that. You and Tom are in agreement on that. That And I, here's what's crazy. Two years ago, you know how bullish I was on it. I'm not as bullish on it now. <laughs> I, I'm just, and Tom has more intel on, on that kind of thing than I do about what Iowa's plans are, but I just, I don't know. I, I think um, certainly if Deacon Hill leaves, you got to go get someone else to have bodies. But you're going to get James Rezar in. You've got a guy in Deacon Hill who's played most of the year. I really like the upset side of Marco Linez. Get Cade McNamara back. How many quarterbacks do you need on scholarship? I guess that's the first thing. And second thing is you're already behind on the scholarship count, so you need guys to leave. Ideally, no offense to Deacon Hill, I think a lot of fans would like to see Deacon just kind of drift off in the sunset, find a new place to play. And that could happen. Um, and, and that more power to him. I hope he goes somewhere and, and uh, has an opportunity to play, but I, I just don't know what's going to be, uh, what's going to be out there. What is going to be out there after spring? Who's Devin Brown? Ohio state, Ohio state has quarterbacks for everybody in the big 10. They get, they can break up their room and hand everybody a quarterback or two. Okay, well, let's bring they, them in, Mark. Since in the last, what, month, they brought in Will Howard, who will be the favorite to win the job from Kansas State. They brought in Julian Sayan, who's the number one rated quarterback, arguably. There's a debate between Hill, he and Dylan Rayola, who signed at Nebraska. And then you've got... Uh, Air Noland, who's a top five quarterback. And then you've got the two guys that were supposed to be the heir apparent, Devin Brown being one of the two. So they've got five that are <clears throat> have enormous ceilings. Uh, but back to, to the uh, Hawkeyes in particular here. Um, here are a few things that, that struck me about uh, today's news conference and also some comments that you guys made so you brought up the 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 word opportunity and this is obviously an opportunity anytime someone takes a new job it's an opportunity but beyond that uh, tim lester's a smart guy and maybe he sees the opportunity here as being different than most places in college football that he can fill a role at a top level football program, but that is so void in this area that this is just a huge career opportunity for him to go in and show what he can do. He had some really good offenses at Western Michigan during a period of time. And the last year was, was not good. Um, and that was brought up today, but he had some really good offenses there. Now translating it over to the power five level, that will be a challenge. Um, but like, I, I am starting to buy into the fact that I think, or the notion that I think this is going to end up being a steal of a hire for Iowa. I don't believe, and you know, we've got a lot of time before the season starts. I don't believe if this offense continues to fail miserably, I then think you have to look beyond who the OC is. Yes. A lot of fans have done that a long time ago, but I don't think you can attribute this. Well, it's just another bad hire. Again, I'm doing more research and, and hearing more about his background and uh, his accomplishments, endorsements from other respected people in the college football coaching sphere makes me think this guy is absolutely qualified for this job. And again, um, my biggest thing is exactly what Tom brought up. He's going to be upstairs. He's going to be able to see the field. That's the way it should have been in the first place, in my opinion. He is a former quarterback. He is going to be working with the quarterbacks and actually working with them as opposed to what we had with Brian, who was a quarterback's coach, and really John Budmeyer was filling that role. That's called dysfunction, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I think th the whole thing is he brought up adjustments, um, making adjustments, how important that is during games. 
how many times this past year or the year before did we at halftime say, man, they're going to have to do something different at halftime. I wonder what adjustments they've got up their sleeve. And it seemed like every time they came out in the second half, it was the exact same thing. There were never adjustments that we could see. And like, I don't, I'm sure Brian tried, but I like, Again, you're limited. I mean, Tim even said that today. He believes that you're limited when you're not able to see the whole field and see what's going on everywhere. It's very hard to make in-game adjustments. Um, So I think that was dysfunctional and didn't help Brian's case. There were a lot of things that I think Brian could have done and Kirk could have done that would not have been all that difficult to change that could have helped his chances at succeeding. One being, I think he should have been up in the press box. Another being, I think they should have brought someone else in who could have coached the passing game, wouldn't have had to take the title on, but could have coached the passing game and allowed Brian to coach running backs. There's a lot of things he'd done the list, but that ship has sailed. Um, My question to Kirk today, and again, I only got one question in. I wanted to ask him a question, just didn't get around to it. But my one question that I got to ask Kirk, and for the record, Kirk was was, uh, made available first for questions. And that's the only reason that I asked this question first, because I wanted to know about Tom or about Tim. But the question that I asked was, you know, in the past, Kirk has been quoted as saying uh, that he believes total offense is the most overrated stat in football. Again, in the press release that uh, announced the hiring of Tim Lester, those numbers were touted. Now, let me ask you this, uh, Mark. Is it a fair question to to ask about kind of assimilating that and, and, and getting to the bottom of, okay, what's actually important here? Do you still agree with what you said a year or two ago about total offense not being important? Or how are we going to evaluate moving forward as it relates to the new OC? That was my question. And it's also not like you picked on one specific statement that Kirk made two years ago about the offense and evaluating the offense. This has been a consistent theme for years that he has gone to a number of times to say wins and losses are all that matter. We play complimentary football. That's how we evaluate the offensive coordinator based on wins and losses. And then here we are. Uh, with a new offensive coordinator. So absolutely fair. And again, I, I happen to believe that, um, uh, yes, Don in the chat, Brian did start in the press box. Again, he had that meltdown in 20, 20, uh, 2017 and then ended up moving down to the field. So I think part of that was what happened in 2017. Anyways, um, what were we talking about? Oh, total offense. So I, I believe that that, press release and the announcement and focusing in on Tim Lester's total offensive numbers is absolutely legitimate and is absolutely something we should be looking at. Those are great indicators for offensive productivity, not everything that needs to be known, but if, if the press release had read, you know, he had was responsible for this many wins at Western Michigan, this many wins at, at Syracuse, you know, and he was the head coach at Western Michigan in his defense, but we're talking about him being the OC at Iowa, not the head coach. Right. So, that's where, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of get a, a feel for where Kirk stood on it. And again, I thought Kirk answered the question very well. Uh, he does. I think it's clear to to say that he does not place as great of importance on total offense as some do. But he explained why. And he explained why. And, and I thought he explained well. Um, and the bottom line is priority wise. Priority is for, for Kirk. It is protecting the football, ball control, time of possession. Um and doing whatever we need to do to get a win. Absolutely. And I agree with that. For the record, I've never disagreed with that. But, um, you know, oftentimes you can, there's no question, you can, there is a correlation between being the 130th ranked total offense and your offense not being good. That's (laughs) a bit of a cause. I think it's a correlation and probably you could argue cause-effect relationship there, direct correlation. Yes. There, there is definitely a correlation between being the worst ranked offense in the country and losing to your three toughest opponents, scoring zero points in those three games. Now, we both know that had the offense thrived under Brian's direction and the defense would have faltered in the special teams and Iowa would have been churning out six and six and seven and five teams the last few years with tremendous offense and horrendous defense then Kirk would be stating, well, the offensive production is what is the responsibility of the offensive coordinator. And the offensive coordinator was producing all these points in yardage, but we didn't uh, supplement it on these other areas. You can about guarantee that. 
Uh, but getting back to Tim Lester, if I may, this is what I was impressed with is, and, and you were there in person to get the full effect. I'm just watching on video. He's a communicator. He's a very confident and comfortable communicator. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons he got a head coaching job, or maybe that's something that he learned as a head coach, probably a little bit of both. And also, I was very impressed with him being uh, as uh, transparent and explaining as much as he did. Um, also giving respect to, he understands the situation. He understands how bad the offense has been. He knows what the situation was uh, with Kirk and Brian and the whole dynamics of the situation. And you touched upon a statement that he made early in his introductory comments. And I'll add one term to it. He said, we're going to be physical. We're going to be disciplined. We're going to be aggressive. He knows that Iowa football is all about being physical and being disciplined, not making mistakes, being physical, being the tougher team, being the team that, that is the team that controls the line of scrimmage. So he knows that that's Iowa's brand and he needs to support that and confirm that. And most football coaches would back that up, whether they're at Iowa or somewhere else. Uh, it's still a physical sport. But then to add to that, the aggressive component, I was kind of curious as to, okay, what does he mean by being aggressive? Uh, to me, as the play caller, that means being aggressive when it makes sense. Uh, he also talked about the running game, and you don't hear this term attached to the running game very often when he said, we want to be an explosive running game. Said that a few times about explosiveness in the running game. And uh, quite a bit of misdirection if you watch some of that tape at uh, Western Michigan, a lot of misdirection with the run game. And I'm going to go back and listen to the press conference again because you're your person. You're, I'm, you know, I was took about a page of notes here, but um, – I'm sure I missed some. I can see why, just from a human perspective, why he impressed Kirk so much in the interview process. I mean, can't you, yeah. Mark? Like, oh yes, yeah. he's, he's very seasoned, and I think that's the thing. Like, no, he doesn't have a ton of Power Five OC experience. And Syracuse was a long time ago. You know how successful was he? You know, Kirk kind of downplayed the Syracuse experiment, by the way, or experience. He kind of downplayed that whole thing because it was a long time ago. But I do think the fact that he was a, I just think the plethora of experience, he's done it at the power five level at, at Syracuse and ACC school. He's done it at um, Western Michigan as a head coach and play caller. He's done it in an FBS school. And then he's, he's uh, coached in the NFL for a year, at kind of a unique position on a Matt LaFleur staff with the green Bay Packers. I just think he brings a lot of seasoned, experience that Iowa did not have at that position the last time they hired an offensive coordinator. Like when Brian Ferentz, I, I wasn't covering Iowa the way I, I try to cover it now. Um, but the last time they, they uh, appointed a, a coordinator or promoted a coordinator was Brian Ferentz. I, I kind of remember that press conference, but like, like what were you going to ask Brian about his experience at new England? Like that's basically what you were going to ask him about. He was a tight ends coach at New England, and he coached positions, a couple of positions at Iowa before being promoted. But like in general, that's what he did. You asked Tim Lester about his experience. Well, he coached the Shanahan offense at Elmhurst. Uh, it was part of that Shanahan offense, I should say, at Elmhurst. Um, he was again the play caller at Western Michigan, OC at Syracuse. Then he was, you know, worked with the Matt Lafleur offense. Um, as an analyst and kind of looking at it from a different perspective, he's done RPO. He's done all these different things. And he's a former quarterback. He played the position that Iowa needs maybe the most help at. I just think all those things should really be encouraging to fans. Um, and again, doesn't mean you can't remain skeptical because there's also reasons to remain skeptical about Kirk's ability to evaluate OCs because he hasn't done a great job of hiring OCs. Not in my opinion. Ken O'Keefe was an okay hire at the time and had good years. Greg Davis didn't really work out and certainly Brian Ferentz didn't work out. So you know, I'm fine with saying I have to see it to believe it, but I, I I am encouraged by everything that I've heard, seen, listened to over the past week. One of the last comments you made to Tom and asked uh, about whether Kirk's going to be open to listening to to Tim's opinions about 
different personnel and direction and so forth. Uh, I hope that Kirk did make a hire of somebody that that he respects to the point where he's going to listen to them and possibly change his thinking about certain things rather than this is a plug and play guy and he's going to direct my offense and he's going to call the plays and I trust him with that, but I don't want to hear anything about doing anything different or any kind of different direction. Uh, just run the offense and we'll be fine. I don't think that's going to happen. I just don't think that's going to happen. I really do believe that having it, not to say that they're going to turn into a top 50 offense, but I'm just saying, like, I do think uh, I'll triple, quadruple down on what I've said so many times before. I think their biggest problem was at the offensive coordinator position. Now, Kirk probably doesn't believe that. In fact, Kirk was quoted. I wrote down a uh, quote from Kirk today, and he this was before any questions were asked. Kirk said, I think it's pretty obvious the reasons why we struggled last year offensively. But then he didn't go into the reasons. Um, and look, I, I I think Kirk already was maybe a little bit touchy with the question that I asked him. Um, I wasn't going to ask, why did you struggle last year, Kirk? I mean, it's an introductory press conference for Tim Lester. So that's why I wanted to focus on how you're going to be evaluating that position, that coach moving forward. But I do think Kirk really does believe in his heart of hearts that had they just stayed healthy, they would have been a lot better. And I, I think, I don't want to call it delusion, but I do think there's a degree of, of having a big blinder on because it is, it is Brian. And hopefully, here's where we're at. Hopefully, like the, the Beth Getz decision or Barbara Wilson, we want to attribute that decision to let Brian go. Regardless of that decision, Brian Ferentz was fired as the offensive coordinator. He was not fired as Kirk's son. So Kirk does not have to agree with the decision and Kirk does not have to believe that Brian was responsible for the putrid offense. But if that was the case, if it was just due to injuries, then they weren't deep enough. And if injuries happen this next year and the year after that with Tim Lester, they're going to be just as crappy. And I don't believe that's going to be the case. I, I just, I have more uh, trust in his experience and his resume uh, than now, I wasn't, like, 1999, I was not, uh, the world was a lot different in 99. So we there were no shows like this talking about Ken O'Keefe being hired. Um, and the Greg Davis hire was such a, a weird situation where, again, I think it was pretty much, a, it's obvious it was a stepping stone to to Brian. But um, I have a lot more faith in this hire than, than I would have expected a week and a half ago. Iowa Hawkeyes live here at the Voice of College Football each and every Tuesday. We appreciate Tom Cakert stopping by from Hawkeye Report. Of course, Corey's here, and uh, you can catch more from Corey on Iowa football and basketball at uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Iowa fans, if you want to continue uh, with Big Ten football talk, we've got uh, our Nebraska show starting here at uh, 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 Central, over on the Huskers channel. Have we talked about before, well, before we get to Tom? I know we got a couple minutes left here. Thomas Meyer, Carson Cooney both committed. And uh, right, because just answer a question from Hawkeye Howard in the chat. He says, Isn't Bud Meyer uh, married to Kirk's daughter? Uh, no, that would be Tyler Barnes, the recruiting coordinator, is married to Kirk's daughter. Uh, John Bud Meyer married a Hartlieb. So there is an Iowa connection there, but it's not through Kirk Ferentz. Anyways, um, Thomas Meyer, really good tight end out of Clear Lake. It's funny. I was just having a conversation with someone Sunday afternoon who's from Mason City. And I said, hey, when's that? When are we going to get an announcement from Thomas Meyer? Came down, I think, was it later the same day? Was that? Yeah, that was uh, that was late Sunday that, that we got an announcement. So that was ironic. Um, boy, big, you look at him on tape, big kid. I talked about that yesterday on the show. He's listed, I think, at 6'5", 210. He almost looks bigger than he's listed as far as just girth. He's a really good basketball player. Seems to have really good hands, especially in traffic. Um, they're going to be just loaded at tight end for the next several years because you know you have Addison Estringa, who has played a lot as an underclassman. Uh, first of all, you get Luke Lachey back this year. That's a huge plus. But then you get another year for Zach Ortworth, who played last year as a freshman. You get Grant Leaper another year. Who knows what the future is for Cale Vanderbush at that position. But then look at all these guys they're bringing in in 24 and 25. 
You've got Thomas Meyer in 25. You got Michael Burton, 24, Gavin Hoffman in 24. That's, I mean, there's a lot of talent coming in out of the high school ranks at that position for a position where Iowa already owns the national scene. You saw Travis Kelsey make a comment in his uh, Super Bowl press conference. I think it was today or yesterday, just about uh, Iowa tight ends. And so when you have Travis, Travis Kelsey mentioning it, bringing it up, I think that's a, a good indicator. There's a lot of respect nationally for what I was doing at that position, not just with George Kittle, but with Sam Laporte and Noah Fan, TJ Hawkinson. Um, so anyways, um, very encouraged by linebacker and at tight end. Uh, Carson Cooney, really solid prospect out of uh, Illinois. I was done very well in the suburban Chicago area. Had a lot of other uh, high major offers. And um, again, good size. I think he's listed at like 6'3", 6'4". Um, and, you know, you, I've said it about Phil Parker. I'll say it about uh, Seth Wallace. You trust Seth Wallace evaluating people. He was the primary recruiter on Carson. Um, I believe Jay Neiman was uh, Thomas Myers' primary recruiter, um, but uh, they're they're going to be pretty stacked at both of those position groups for a while. So, what is the secret sauce at tight end? That it, it's got to be a combination of scouting and development. It can't be either one because it's not like they rolled in the number one tight end in the country every year, and therefore they just spit them out three years later to the NFL. No, they're developing. A couple of highly ranked guys. Uh, Myers, a top 10 guy, but still. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, if we're going to we're going to blame Kirk Ferentz for certain things, I think you got to give him credit. He's been the common denominator, right? Like they've had good tight ends basically since he took over. And there were times where Brian Ferentz was coaching tight ends. There was, I think, a time when Reese Morgan was coaching tight ends. LeVar Woods coached tight ends. Uh you know, now you uh, you have Abdul Hodge coaching tight ends. They seem to get very similar results, regardless of who's coaching the tight ends. So, what's the what's the common denominator there, Mark? To me, I mean, I think it's the system. And you may say, well, you're really going to compliment the Iowa system. Well, when I say system, I'm talking culture, um, emphasis, as you mentioned, recruiting, being able to identify. I think you just got to give Kirk Ferentz uh, a lot of credit. Uh, he and guys like Seth Wallace and uh, Reese Morgan, even before Brian Ferentz deserves some credit for that. But the common denominator in my mind is Kirk. So I think sometimes we mix uh, development and, and featuring that position. They haven't always featured the tight end to give them big numbers, but they have certainly developed them and prepared them to shine at the NFL level and to impress NFL scouts they're they're and it's except for probably George Kittle it's not like these tight ends were under the radar at Iowa and then they just balloon you know blossomed in the NFL they were highly evaluated at Iowa are high draft picks and then excel at the NFL level yeah but, but for the record I mean one thing we got to remember is George Kittle really struggled with injuries at Iowa. Yeah. And I, I think he could have been so much better on paper. I mean, he showed plenty of flashes in 2015 and 2016, but he dealt with injuries. Um, you know, Noah Fant was barely playing at the end of the 2017 season. That was kind of an odd or 2018 season. That was kind of an odd situation, but he was a defensive end coming out. Of, I think Omaha as a high schooler developed into a, a really, really, good tight end and has not had the best NFL career of anybody, but he's been solid. He's not had very good offenses to work with, not very good quarterbacks or stable situations to, uh, to deal with. He's got years left in the tank. Um, but like, you know, guys like TJ Hawkinson, I think he was, was he Sheraton? I always forget which uh, small town that starts with a C was the hometown of TJ Hawkinson, but not real highly thought of coming out of high school. Um, you know, certainly Luke Lachey is another good example. I mean, he was a good recruit. His people knew about his dad and the Ohio State connection. But I mean, in general, they've just gotten prospects and developed them. Addison Estringo was I remember having a discussion with Addison when he first signed on from Sun Prairie. And I'm like, you know, you're ranked like 1200th in the country. How does that make you feel like? How do you deal with that? Cherokee. Thank you. Cool. Stipulate Cherokee, not Sheraton. Cherokee. Um, and Addison Estringo played as a freshman. You know, who would have expected that? He was originally committed to Iowa as a baseball player. Um, and then Sam Laporta and uh, uh, you mentioned George Kittle. So, so many examples. Most of those guys were not highly thought of in Iowa or before Iowa, before um, 
Iowa got them into the system and and developed them. Um, and I really, I said before, I think really highly of Michael Burt, Gavin Hoffman. I think really highly of Addison Estringa. I think really highly of Thomas Meyer. And I actually think really highly of Grant Leeper too. The one guy I didn't think as highly of was Zach Ortworth. And he played as a true freshman last year. So I'm like, well, I, I'm not going to pretend. A big catch against Wisconsin, right? Huge catch. Yep. Huge catch. And Iowa fans take some pride in this as well. And I think I've got a pretty good handle on this. Maybe not as good as I did at one point when I really was all over the NFL. But not only can Iowa claim to be tight end you, I don't think there's another position where you can make and attach a school to a position and just say, end of discussion. It's not a debate. There's a debate at every other position. But currently looking at what's been produced in the last 10 to 15 years at Iowa, it's not a debate. It is all time, but in the last 10 or 15 years, and currently it's not a discussion. And there are other schools that have produced really good tight ends. Miami's one. Um, Minnesota has Notre had Dame. really good tight ends. Notre Dame. Iowa State's had really good tight ends. And by the way, as it relates to Thomas Meyer, a couple other offers on the list that are notable. Mizzou offered, Miami, Florida offered. Um, I know Iowa State, and Minnesota both offered. Again, good tight end schools. He had, I mean, he's a four star kid. So this is a, a really good land. Again, I think, uh, what did I say? Top 15, top 15 tight end nationally. Um, and frankly, who cares? I mean, <laughs> like you said, I mean, just that mantra, that, that, that label that I was earned. Um, it's like, you, how could you possibly doubt anything they're doing there? Um, and it is an oddity. It is kind of an odd thing, but I, I you know, you got to give credit where credit is due. It, it gives me joy to be able to say, Hey, Kirk Ferentz does it. And that, I would have loved to been able to ask for the record. Um, that I was only able to ask one question today to Kirk. I had my hand up the whole time for Tim Lester. Didn't get called on. That's that. Um, I know there's a lot of people involved with these media availabilities. So I appreciate the fact that, uh, they were given access, but uh, I'd love to be able to get, Kirk one-on-one, get Tim one-on-one, because there's a lot of great questions. That's being one is what is the secret sauce at Iowa with, with all these different coaches, Kirk, how have you, have you done this all these different years? Cause I don't think he gets, he gets enough credit. Everybody loves to credit Iowa, but like, again, what's the common denominator? It's not like they're just drinking tight end water in Iowa city and all of a sudden they become prospects. So. And again, just to underline, it's not strictly recruiting like it is for other schools at other positions. And I'm not saying that the, that they don't develop those positions, but it's a pretty obvious correlation between, OK, they get the best recruits at that position or at a number of positions. Boom, they're NFL players three years later. That's a pretty obvious correlation here. It's fairly underregarded tight ends in a lot of cases being developed into not just tight ends that are sitting on rosters in the NFL <laughs> guys that are really good players and elite players. So oh, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I don't know the next time we're going to have availability with the coaches. I'm guessing that's going to be spring. I'm guessing uh, because I don't think we're going to have, there's nothing for signing day. There's, they're not signing anybody, Mark, <laughs> for the official signing day. So um I think the festivities today are, are what we're going to have until the start of spring practice, which is in about a month and a half away. Um, the the storyline to follow right now is what happens with LeVar Woods. And I'm, I'm reading on the Buccaneers website that apparently they, uh, let's see, uh, the Buccaneers, I think maybe Tom mentioned this, but um, they have, uh, uh, let's see, at least three interviews have uh, transpired for that job. I can tell you this, that if, if he leaves, there could very easily be people that are on scholarship at Iowa that enter the portal. Like, I'm just saying that right now. I mean, I, I don't know that Drew Stevens would enter the portal, but I, I wouldn't put it past him. Um, some of these kids, they come to, to kick for LeVar Woods and fair enough. I mean, he's been phenomenal. Yeah, it would be a huge loss, but at the same time, their stability in those two areas, defense and special teams, is pretty outstanding compared uh, considering their success. Because typically, 
success breeds the double-edged sword is that you lose coaches and coordinators. And and maybe this ha does have something to do with the Seth promotion. You know, you don't know. I, I remember thinking that when the news first came out about Seth Wallace, I was like, yeah, oh, that's interesting. I mean, Seth, I'm not saying Seth's not deserving, but people have been talking about LeVar being the next head coach. And you're going to name Seth Wallace the assistant head coach and, and have him as a linebackers coach making more than one of your three coordinators. Now, granted, special teams coordinator is a different position than offensive and defensive coordinator. Okay, let's just make that totally clear. But as important as special teams is to Iowa, you know, who knows? And I have no idea what the pay comparison is between the NFL and college football as a special teams coordinator. And by the way, Coyle stipulate in the chat. Yeah, Lester did bring up meeting uh, Reese Dakin uh, the other day from Australia. Let's not forget, Le LeVar Woods went down there in December to go get Reese Dakin. So I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Guys are going to have to continue to recruit even if they have visions of leaving. But this seems to be somewhat of a pivot. Um, I don't know. Seems to be somewhat of a pivot. He was going across the globe to get a recruit last month or a little over a month ago, and now he's interviewing for a job in a different part of the country. I don't know. He's also got his kid, by the way, uh, his, I almost said real Woods, he's a wrestler. Uh, his son, LeVar Woods' son, is playing at Iowa City West, and um, he's got another year in front of him, I believe. So you know, what happens if he takes that job? Does he transfer out? I mean, I, I think a lot of people felt like LeVar would probably stick it out until at least his kid graduated high school, but who knows? Join Corey every day at uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm, folks. You know where to find it. You should from the Hawkeye of the Storm, men's and women's basketball and football, of course. When's the next uh, basketball game, whether men's or women's? Both of them play tomorrow. Both of them play tomorrow. Um, we're going to have probably a uh, probably. Um, a post game show, dual post game show for both the men and the women. So they're they're actually back to back games. So one starts at six, one starts at eight. So we'll have a fun post game show at about ten p.m. Central Time tomorrow night. Or excuse me, on uh, Thursday night. I almost announced that wrong. Thursday night. Nothing tomorrow night, but Thursday night we'll have we'll have stuff coming out here uh, on the show tomorrow. But uh, it's going to be a, a busy month still, and we're almost to the finish line of the busy season, and then we head into a long off season with spring football and and all that good stuff. We are on our way to talk some Nebraska football. So Iowa fans, uh, catch up on your rival. We will talk uh, Nebraska football here in about a half hour or so. Make it 20 minutes over on the Nebraska channel, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central. Otherwise, make it on back here next Tuesday. Bring a friend or two or 50, and uh, we will talk Hawkeyes football with all of you. Corey, much appreciated as always. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.